Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ford Presidential Museum. I'm pleased to see all of the refugees from the last night of campaign commercials. Uh, driving over this afternoon, I finally turned off the radio because I couldn't hear the same ads for anybody in the world one more time. So uh, we're, we're here tonight for a pre-election uh, preview of uh, what the new president might think about with regard to our intelligence operations. And it's a real pleasure to have Tim Weiner with us this evening. Tim spoke at the library in Ann Arbor on a sunny Sunday afternoon this recent June, and we were overwhelmed to have a full house. Given that success, we decided he must come to Grand Rapids to provide the citizens of, of West Michigan this same opportunity. We're really pleased to have Ralph Howenstein here tonight. Several of us had dinner just now with Ralph and our speaker. And for those of you familiar with uh, Ralph's background in intelligence during the end of World War II with, uh, with Eisenhower, you can imagine that it was a fascinating dinner conversation uh, where one wanted to just sit quietly like a mouse and take notes. So Ralph, it's great to have you with us, and I'm so glad that you were free for dinner. For those of you who uh, haven't met me yet, my name is Elaine Didier and I serve as director of both the Ford Library in Ann Arbor and the Ford Museum here in Grand Rapids. Tim Weiner, our speaker tonight, is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who for 20 years has covered the CIA and has reported from 18 nations covering wars, coups, and the foreign policies of the United States. In 1988, as an investigative reporter for the Philadelphia Enquirer, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for reporting in recognition of articles exposing the secret spending of the CIA and the Pentagon. From 92 to 99, as the Washington Bureau reporter for the New York Times, he broke more than 100 page one stories about the CIA and its troubles. Tonight, we're introducing to you his best-selling book, Legacy of Ashes, The History of the CIA, which won the 2007 National Book Award for Nonfiction. It recently came out in paperback by Anchor Books of Random House with a, with a new foreword, and that is available here this evening. Some of the kudos for the book are truly amazing. From the Washington Post, must reading for anyone interested in the CIA. From the Wall Street Journal, the best book I've read yet on the CIA's covert operations. The LA Times, a timely and vital contribution that glitters with relevance. And perhaps the most chilling comment from the Christian Science Monitor, by far the scariest book of the year. Mr. Weiner's book is of particular interest to those of us in the world of presidential archives. The Ford Archive in Ann Arbor has a great collection of government documents, memos, reports, and minutes on national security activities and CIA-specific activities in the 1960s and 1970s. Some of the material, but far less than we would like, and far, far less than Mr. Weiner would have hoped, uh, some of it has been open to research, and more is being opened all the time. So it's a great pleasure for all of us to see the material that we house being opened and being made available to researchers. A final bit of housekeeping, if you have a cell phone with you, would you please turn it off or put it on vibrate? And now, please join me in welcoming Tim Weiner to the Ford Museum. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. You have a fantastic resource here in the Ford Museum in the Ford Library down in Ann Arbor. I know that's a blue part of the state. Uh, it's uh, still a marvelous place to be, and Elaine Didier has done an amazing job uh, curating it. It's a great gift. It exists, and we are here tonight, because of an extraordinary series of events 35 years ago that caused Richard Nixon to fall from power and catapulted Gerald Ford into the Oval Office. And looking around, I know that most of you remember these events. I certainly do. Um, and I'm gratified by that. I mean, when I talk about the Cold War tonight, at least you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm grateful for that. Um, but we forget sometimes what it was that happened. It was the extraordinary use and abuse of the CIA by Richard Nixon that finally caused him to leave office. It was the fact that President Nixon had ordered the Director of Central Intelligence to get the FBI to stop investigating a Watergate burglary on national security grounds. That's what's on the smoking gun tape. That's what caused him to leave. 
and that's what brought Jerry Ford to power. We're going to talk tonight about those events, but we're going to place them in the context of the long struggle we have had as a nation to balance security and liberty and to use our powers to keep us both safe and free. We want both security and liberty. We want to be safe and free. But we sometimes find that when we grant powers to secret government, the less free we may be. Alexander Hamilton foresaw this way back in 1787 during the debates on the Constitution. He said, and I quote, that Americans would resort for repose and security to institutions which have a tendency to destroy their civil and political rights. To be more safe, they at length become willing to run the risk of being less free. This battle that goes on between security and liberty, between secret government and an open society, is not a clash of absolutes. And even I, an ink-stained wretch, a newspaper reporter, recognize this. Freedom of speech can give way when an advocate intends to provoke imminent unlawful action. The right of political association granted in the Constitution can give way when it intends to promote the unlawful acts of a group. Even the great writ of habeas corpus can be suspended, the Constitution says, when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. But our framers wanted an open government. They did not want secret government. They insisted, for example, that spending be published in a public budget. As James Madison wrote, a popular government without popular information is but a prelude to a tragedy or a farce, or perhaps both. The framers wanted a, that the people, the American people, to be their own governors, to have information about what the government was up to. In recent years, we have traveled some distance from these ideals. The president, President Bush, invoking his authority as commander in chief, has used the CIA and the FBI and the National Security Agency, which conducts electronic eavesdropping overseas, and now we know within the United States. He has used them to create zones of pres presidential power that arguably exist outside the law. Secret government surveillance, secret, secret warrantless wiretapping, these received presidential authorization. They also received it from prior, prior presidents, going back a long way. So did secret detentions. Our secret intelligence services have used these methods, unchecked by courts or the Congress. And all of these practices are arguably illegal, arguably unconstitutional, but they are also arguably part of the American tradition. Lord Acton, who memorably told us that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, also observed that everything secret degenerates, and nothing is safe that cannot withstand public scrutiny. We're going to take a look at the use of secret presidential power in the name of national security to show how it grew up in the American political tradition, how President Nixon and then President Ford confronted these powers and use these powers, and what they tell us about the presidency today and the presidency that will exist starting sometime tomorrow, we think. <laughs> Presidents of both parties, in times of war and in times of peace, have used and abused secret intelligence. No wartime president has felt completely constrained by the Constitution. In, the, in times of crisis, in the name of national security, some of our greatest presidents have violated the Constitution. President Nixon spoke for some of his predecessors and a few of his successors when he said in his famous interview with David Frost in 1977, when the president does it, that means it is not illegal. <laughs> his Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, Dr. Henry Kissinger, put it a little more pithily, with tongue in cheek, perhaps. The illegal we do immediately, the unconstitutional takes a little longer. 